Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about some basic concepts of chemistry. So let's start. So when we talk about the basics in chemistry, the first word which comes to anyone's mind is matter. Okay, so talking about the definition of matter, anything that has mass and occupies space is called matter. Well, who does not know that? But to try to understand it, I think I'll ask you one question. What do you see on your screen? You know, everybody I think watching this video is going to have a different answer. Some people can say they see buildings, some people can say they see cars, people, you know, subway written somewhere, but I think there's only one answer. The answer to what you see on your screen is matter. So my point being that anything and everything that you see around you, the pen you're holding, the your phone, whatever, the laptop you see in front of you, if you have a laptop in front of you, is nothing but matter, even the air around you, okay? It's having a mass, it occupies space, it is matter. Moving on, we have another term or a set of terms which is atoms and molecules. What are these and how do we tell them apart? Let's understand. On your screen, what you see right now is a picture of a beautiful castle, okay? Now, if I want to break the castle, and don't ask me why, I just want to break the castle, and I will see that the castle is actually made up of an amalgamation of different walls combined together. Okay, so if I also try to break this wall, again, don't ask me why, but I want to know what is, you know, there inside, inside the castle. So if I try to break the wall also, I will see that the wall is actually made up of nothing but a number of bricks combined together. So I can very, very easily say that a brick which you see on your screen is nothing but the smallest unit of the entire castle or the entire castle is made up of one reiterating or smallest unit which is brick which is the brick which you see on your screen right so again the same question could be asked for matter what is the smallest indivisible unit for matter okay and scientists were really curious to know okay, what is the basic unit of the matter which you see around you this question was first, uh, you know, uh, asked by a Greek philosopher who was called Democritus. He first asked the question that what is the smallest indivisible unit of matter? Okay. And he called that basic unit as atomos. Okay. There's no typo here. Actually, he called it atomos and today we call it atom. So the idea basically was that if we keep dividing matter into smaller, 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 smaller parts, then we are going to reach a point which is not further divisible and that point, that point is called atom. Okay. So the idea is that the basic building block of chemistry is nothing but atom. But is it? Okay. Because today, now we know after all the research and everything which has happened in the field of science, we know that atom is actually not indivisible, but it's actually very much divisible into not one, but three subatomic particles, okay, which is, I guess, everybody knows is electrons, protons, and neutrons, okay. Electron is having a charge of minus one, proton is having a charge of plus one, and neutron, well, is a neutral species. So my point being that atom is actually further divisible into subatomic particles called electron, proton, and neutron. In higher classes, you will know that it's actually even further divisible into some things called quarks, but let's leave it to another day. Now, uh, on the same lines, there was a scientist whose name was John Dalton, and he gave a beautiful theory called John uh, Dalton's Atomic Theory. Now, this theory was well rejected, and uh, the reason was the first point which you see on your screen. The first point says that matter consists of indivisible atoms. Again, we know it's not true. Matter consists of quite divisible atoms and those atoms are divisible into subatomic particles. Again, the same thing. And I think you know why the theory was rejected. Well, that was a bad day for John Dalton, but moving on. Now we have to know what is matter and there are two kinds of classifications of matter. The first classification is on the basis of physical form, okay? Physical form meaning, you know, the way you see it, the way it's visible to you, okay? So matter uh, is visible to you in three different forms, which is solids, liquids, and gases. The most easy difference, if I say, is the structure and the way we see it, which means solids are quite uh, rigid, right? The reason being that the bonds are quite strong, the atoms or the molecules by which the solid are made are quite tightly held with each other, and that's why solids are rigid liquids on the other hand are quite flowy they are not rigid okay and because the bonds are quite weaker and the gases we know that are quite flowy not at all rigid which means the bonds are very very weak right we will study in detail about solids liquids and gases once we get the chance to but 
that's not today that's not happening today so matter is having a second classification is which is which is on the basis of macroscopic level okay so on the basis of macroscopic level matter is classified into mixtures and pure substances okay so if we talk about pure substances we can see that there are two pictures on your screen the first picture is of copper metal okay so the first picture is actually of copper metal and not one not two but millions and trillions of copper atoms okay i just write the word atom here so copper atoms combine together to form this amount of copper which you see on your screen the second picture is of a glass of water okay so not one not two but millions and trillions of water molecules combine together to form this amount of copper uh, water which you see on your screen so pure substances are classified into two parts which is elements and compounds in case of element the basic repeating unit is actually an atom in this case copper atom and in case of compounds the basic repeating unit is actually a molecule in this case a water molecule for mixtures again there are two kinds of mixtures the first one is a uh, mixture of salt and water and we very clearly know that salt and water do mix with each other they are quite soluble into each other and we cannot physically see a difference between the solute and solvent in this case and that kind of mixture is called a homogeneous mixture whereas the other mixture as you can see is a mixture of water and oil everybody knows that they do not mix with each other they are not soluble with each other so we can physically see the separation between these two and this kind of mixture is called a heterogeneous mixture so if i just you know try to conclude it i can say what is the difference between atom and molecule so atom is actually a basic building block of an element element could be mercury it could be gold or it could be copper which you already see have seen whereas in case of molecule a molecule is a basic building block of a compound a compound could be you know water which you already have discussed uh, it could be sodium chloride which is again a molecule and uh, it could be co2 gas which is a molecule of c and two ox uh, atoms of oxygen so if we have listened to what i was saying in this video what we have done is uh, we have talked about matter and its classifications we now know what are atoms what are molecules and how are they different from each other we also know what are subatomic particles and we know about dalton's theory uh, dalton's atomic theory and its rejection too so whenever we have any reaction in chemistry so it's a very basic reaction which is written a converts to b where a of course is my reactant and b of course is a product okay so when any kind of combination chemical combination or chem any chemical reaction takes place in chemistry it takes place with respect to certain laws and those five laws are called laws of chemical combination okay well unfortunately chemistry is not this easy that there'll always be one reactant and one product no of course we can have you know a number of reactants and a number of products which are formed but any chemical combination which you see in front of your eyes is going to be happening with respect to the law of chemical combination which we study in this video so let's begin the first law is called the law of conservation of mass okay so what i'm going to do is i will talk about first i'll talk about the statement of the law and then we'll discuss what the law basically means okay so the law of conservation of mass states that matter can neither be created nor be destroyed okay so i think the statement is something which is true for energy also and we all know that but what this statement actually means let's understand okay so for example let's say you have a box okay and you add two balls into the box because you have two balls two blue colored balls and you add it into the box which you have now you close the box okay and then again after some time you open the box what do you expect how many balls would you expect to come out of the bo box of course you won't expect one ball you won't expect five balls because you added two balls you would expect two balls to come out right this exactly is nothing but the law of conservation of mass that whatever mass you put in you expect the same mass to come out and nothing otherwise okay so in a reaction which you see on your screen this is a reaction which is a very simple reaction i'll just write it otherwise okay so of course on the right hand side you see four oxygen atoms one two three four okay after the reaction you would expect of course not one not two not three but four oxygen atoms to be present okay so there are one two three four oxygen atoms which is right okay again on the left hand side you see four hydrogen atoms one two three four and on the right hand side you see exactly the same one two three four okay on the left hand side you see one carbon atom and the right hand side you see one carbon atom and this is 
a right equation or a correct equation because all the masses are balanced and uh, this is the reason basically why we always balance all the chemical reactions otherwise they're not true if we don't balance the chemical reaction they're not in line with the law of conservation of mass and they're not correct okay so because of this law we can also predict the react we also can predict the products of some reactants if we know the amount of the reactants and of course we have to balance all the equations okay Moving on, we have the second law, which is the law of definite proportions. Okay, so let's first see the statement of the law. A given compound always contains exactly the same proportion of element by weight. So I've written weight in a different color because you'll see why in a while. But uh, this is a very important law and you have to just first read the statement and then I'll understand. We'll understand how. Okay, so a given compound. In this case, I will talk about a compound which is water. Okay, water is H2O. Everybody knows what water is. Hena. Contains exactly the same proportions of elements by weight. So water is having two elements, oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, oxygen of course is uh, one and hydrogen is two. Right. So the ratio if I say it is oxygen is to hydrogen is one is to two. This law is basically saying what? For example, you have... A glass of water which you take out of the refrigerator of your own house okay and your friend who's sitting in germany let's say you have a friend in germany he or she also does the same and they you know get a glass of water uh, from their refrigerator out there in germany okay irrespective of the source of water the water molecule is always going to be one atom of oxygen uh, and two atoms of hydrogen combined okay so this is always going to be the composition of uh, water irrespective of the source of water which you have so this water these two waters are from different countries but they could have been from any different two places of the world okay but water is always going to be having two elements which is hydrogen okay and oxygen combining in the ratio 2 is to 1 and nothing otherwise okay so irrespective of the source any element uh, when two elements combine okay to form a compound uh, they will always have the ratio is going to be always uh, the same okay so i hope you get what i'm trying to say so after this law this next law which we have uh, to read is the galois law of gaseous volumes okay so this law is nothing but exactly what we read in the last slide which is the law of definite proportions but by volume so you can see i have highlighted the word by volume here okay so that law talks about uh, ratio by weight and this law talks about ratio by volume and everything else is exactly the same okay so the same example can be used here of water but uh, now we'll talk about the volumes uh, instead of the weight and everything else is going to be the same okay the next law which we have is law of multiple proportions. So let's see what this law has to say. If two elements can combine to form more than one compound, okay, the masses of one of the element that combine with the fixed mass of the other element are in the ratio of whole numbers. So I think I just read a script, okay? So let's understand what the script actually has to say. So if two elements can combine, two elements, let's say I am having hydrogen and oxygen, the same example I'm taking, okay? to form more than one compound so hydrogen and oxygen can combine to form water we all know that but they can also combine to form hydrogen peroxide which i, I guess if you don't know you should know it now so h2o2 is also something they can combine to form and h2o2 sabko pata hai, i guess okay so h2o and h2o2 are two different compounds which can be formed by this combination of the same two elements hydrogen and oxygen okay the masses of one of the element that combines with the fixed mass of the other element okay so this these two h2o and h2o2 what do they have in common they have h2 in common two atoms of hydrogen are in common right so the fixed mass in this case is h2 all right and then what is the other element of course oxygen right so the the masses of one of the element that combine with the fixed mass of the other element are in the ratio of simple whole numbers so here in this case the fixed mass is hydrogen so the left one is the other one which is oxygen so if i compare h2o2 versus h2 okay so fixed mass is of course hydrogen so if i just compare the you know ratio of oxygen atoms it is 2 is to 1 in this case okay so this law is basically saying it cannot be 2.5 is to 1 it cannot be 1.5 is to 1 okay it will always be 2 is to 1 no matter what 
So the next law is the Avogadro's law. Okay, so the Avogadro's law states equal volume of gases at same temperature and pressure should contain equal number of molecules slash number of moles. Okay, so what this equation, what this law is basically saying is that, for example, if you have two gases, let's say there's gas one and gas two. These two gases, the first gas is at pressure P1, volume V1, temperature T1 and the second gas is at pressure P2, volume V2 and temperature T2, okay. The law is saying if all these three variables are same, that is pressure P1 is equal to P2, V1 is equal to V2 and T1 is equal to T2, then definitely N1 or number of moles of this gas must be equal to number of moles of the other gas, okay. We all this, know this equation, PV is equal to NRT. This is the equation of ideal gases. If you don't know about this equation, don't worry because in the next chapter, which is the gaseous state, you will know what this equation is. So stay tuned for that. So if you know what this equation is, um, if I just put uh, the first gas, which is P1, V1 is equal to NRT1, okay, and divide by P2, V2 is equal to NRT2, okay, and as I already know, T1 is equal to T2, V1 is equal to V2, P1 is equal to P2, and R is the gas constant, they are same. So this states N1 upon N2 is equal to 1, which means N1 is equal to N2. So I mathematically proved it that if the pressure, volume, and temperature of two gases are same, then they will definitely have the same number of moles. And if they have the same number of moles, they will have the same number of molecules. And that's all, okay? So this is the Avogadro's law. And if you have any doubts in any of the laws which I just mentioned, so definitely you can ask me, uh, okay, whenever. Uh, if we think logically, limiting, the word limiting actually tells us something which is going to limit my reaction, okay? Limit my reaction to reach its full potential. That's what a limiting reagent should logically do. So correct, logic is totally fine. A uh, limiting reagent is going to do nothing but because of the less quantity in which it is present, the reagent which is present in the less quantity, because of that it is going to limit the product formation and that is what a limiting reagent is, okay? So if I try to give you a small example, we all know how to make tea, okay? If you don't, you should learn that. So tea is basically made up of four uh, ingredients, okay? That is milk, there is sugar, okay? If you do not drink sugarless tea, then there is water and there is tea, which is tea leaves finally, okay? Now, if I have all these ingredients with me, I can make tea very easily, okay? But let's say I have milk uh, with me in a good quantity, sugar also in a good quantity, water also in a good quantity, but tea leaves, I only have two spoons, okay? Only two spoons of tea leaves are left with me. So in this case, no matter how much milk, sugar and water I have, I will only be, may, be able to make tea that is enough that can be made out of these two spoons present. Okay. So all these four, uh, three ingredients which are present in excess with me, these are called excess reagents and they're not even required. Okay. Because no matter whether they are present or not, the only amount of tea which I can make is because of these two spoons, okay? So this, in this case, tea leaves is actually a limiting reagent here because this small quantity of tea leaves actually limits my tea formation and I cannot make the tea till my, you know, full extent, which means a large quantity of tea. So now let's start with the chemistry of it. This is a small example which I gave you to just understand the topic and now let's deep, in, deep dive into the chemistry part. So in chemistry, we have reactions in which we have a single reactant, okay? So those reactants are called by unimolecular reactants. So we have A changes to B. This kind of reaction is called a unimolecular reaction. In these reactions, I do not require a limiting reagent because of course there's only one reactant, okay? So this reactant, however much I have this reactant, I will be able to make B out of uh, however much amount of A I have and that is going to be enough. But in cases where I have multiple reactants with me, okay, in cases like this, I will require the concept of limiting reagent because now I have to think about which reaction is present in a less quantity and then I will be moving on to the cal calculation of product by using that uh, reactant which is present in less quantity okay so now these kind of reactions are important to me for limiting reagent now the first thing which i have to think about and i have to always keep in mind is always used a balanced chemical equation this is the most important thing and i don't know how much i should stress on this because if you are not using a balanced chemical equation your stoichiometry is not correct and the answer of course is not going to be correct okay so all your efforts are going to be in vain so first and the foremost thing is use a balanced chemical equation. So let's do that. 
now let's say i have an equation with me okay and i have to go and find a limiting reagent out of it okay and hence find the product so let's say my reaction is h2 plus o2 gives h2 the first thing that i notice is that the reaction is not balanced so i have to do that okay so this 2h2 plus o2 gives 2h2 now this equation looks balanced enough now how do i read this reaction i can read this reaction as two moles of h2 okay combined with two moles or oh, sorry single one single mole of o2 to form two moles of water right i can read this equation in form of moles or i can read this equation also in form of molecules two molecules of h2 combined with one molecule of o2 to form two molecules of h2 is that correct okay so when we do this this number 2 here and number 1 here and this number 2 here okay this is nothing but the stoichiometry of the reaction okay so i can change this stoichiometry this stoichiometry comes only after balancing and correct balancing if i may stress on that because if you are not doing correct balancing your stoichiometry of course is not correct and your answer is not going to be correct right so stoichiometry is this word written here okay in front of your molecule if there's nothing it's one right and this is the most important aspect of limiting reagent okay now how do we calculate the limiting reagent limiting reagent ki jo formula hai that is nothing it's very simply number of moles divided by your stoichiometry okay this is the formula for limiting reagent okay so i i i have given you all the background of the story and i think we should start a numerical and then it is going to be quite clear this is a numerical which is present in your ncert this is an example uh, you know in, in your ncert 50 kg of n2 and 10 kg of h2 are mixed to form nh3 which is ammonia calculate the amount of nh3 formed and identify the limiting reagent it's not written here so i have written so the first and foremost thing is they have not given me the equation so i should write the equation there's n2 and there's h2 and there's a formation of ammonia which is nh3 okay the first and the foremost thing which i notice is the reaction is not balanced okay let's do that uh, so there's 2 nh3 here so this 2 and there's 6 so there's 3 so i hope this equation is balanced enough now since this equation is balanced enough can i see my uh, stoichiometric numbers n is 1 h2 is 3 and uh, ammonia is 2 okay these are my stoichiometric numbers now i am also given their amount so n2 is present 50 kg okay h2 is 10 kg and i have to find out the amount of ammonia which is formed of course since there are two reactants multiple reactants are there so i have to first think about what is my limiting reagent and according to that my product is going to be formed right okay so how do we do that we have to find the limiting reagent limiting reagent is number of moles okay divided by stoichiometry so stoichiometry is quite clear to me here is 1 this is 3 this is 2 okay stoichiometry is clear to me i have to find out the number of moles so let's do that 50 kg is my mass here so what is the number of moles it is given mass upon molar mass so since both should be in grams i'll convert this 15 kg into grams okay and this is n2 this is 28 right and uh, this is the number of moles of n2 number of moles of h2 is 10 into again converting into grams okay upon 2 because 2 is the molar mass of h2 so if i calculate this this comes out to be somewhere equal to 1785 i guess okay 0.7 and this comes out to be equal to 5000 okay okay so now this is my number of moles don't think of this number as my limiting reagent limiting reagent is number of moles divided by stoichiometry so now since i have the number of moles i'll divide them by the stoichiometry so this divided by in this case stoichiometry n2 is 1 this is going to be 1 and this is divided by 2 sorry 3 the stoichiometry here is 3 okay so this come out comes out to be approximately equal to 1666.6 so now i have to compare these two numbers this number and 1785 divided by one is one right so this number out of these two i can see this is my smaller number and now i know that my h2 or dihydrogen is my limiting reagent
so the dihydrogen is going to identify or is going to determine the amount of product which is formed so now i guess the calculation is simply nothing but your unitary method so let's do that okay so now three moles of h2 gives rise to two moles of nh3 is that clear i can see that from the balanced chemical equation now one mole is going to give rise to two divided by three and how many moles do i have i have 5000 moles right so 5000 moles of h2 is going to give rise to 2 by 3 into 5000 moles of ammonia which is nh3 clear but in the question they have asked me in grams so i have to provide the answer in grams what i'm providing right now is a number of moles so nothing it's not very difficult number of moles say we can easily calculate the amount so i'll do just do nothing and just multiply this answer with the molar mass of ammonia which is 2 by 3 into 5000 whatever the answer comes out to be is going to be in number of moles uh, is going to be in moles i'll multiply by that by uh, 17 which is the molar mass of ammonia and i will get my answer okay in grams so i hope we are clear with what is limiting reagent and how do we calculate limiting reagent the most important thing i think i'm stressing on it again is always balance your chemical equation only then start with the question and if you have any further doubts you can ask me so this video is very very important in the sense that sometimes the examiner does not even want to know whether you know the formulas or not they're only checking whether you can convert your answer into a different desired unit, okay? So that's why this video is important not only for physics, not only for chemistry, but in general science. So on that note, we'll start with the chapter, okay? So now, uh, when we talk about some physical quantities, okay? Physical quantities like, for example, you, we have length, okay? We have mass, we have volume. So all these are different physical quantities. These physical quantities can be measurable, okay? We can measure them. And when we measure these physical quantities, we do that uh, in form of two components. The first component is the numerical value and the second component is called the unit. For example, if I write 5 centimeter, okay, which is the length, of course, then your 5 here represents the numerical value and centimeter here represents the unit, okay? So, the entire unit component is what we are going to be studying in this video. So, Let's begin. Now, when we talk about units and unit conversions, there is a table which we unfortunately have to remember in order to solve, you know, the questions and actually go ahead and perform all the conversions. Okay. But the good news is we know we have a way to do that. We have a way to memorize that table. So we'll do that in a while. But first, let me just write that table. Okay. So there is this basic quantity. Or the basic unit which is there all right which in this video i'll be taking it as meter and now i will write all the prefixes which we can add with your basic unit which can be centimeter millimeter kilometer and different basic uh, other physical uh, other prefixes which we can use okay so all the prefixes which will have a value larger than, than that of your basic value i'm going to write above so this is deca hecto kilo mega giga and tera okay so and all the prefixes which have a value smaller than that of basic unit i'll write below we have deci centi milli micro nano and peak okay so now this is a table which i've written and now i'll write what value they signify okay so i'll write it just uh, ahead of them so the basic quantity or basic unit is one because since it's, of course it's not having any prefix right uh, now deca as we go above the value will increase with 10 raised to power one so it's 10 to power one 10 to power two 10 to power three and after three the table will follow three stable okay so after 10 to power three we have 10 to power six 10 to power 9 and 10 to power 12 okay it's a little clumsy here but i hope it's visible what i've written again below this 10 to power minus 1 10 to power minus 2 10 to power minus 3 and after minus 3 it's going to follow 3's table this 10 to power minus 9 10 to power minus uh sorry minus 6 minus 9 and 10 to power minus 12 
okay so now all these numbers signify a certain uh, you know 10 raised to power or an exponent value and now whenever we have to perform any conversion okay we will just have to calculate the total number of difference of zeros and we get the answer so well how to memorize this table we'll do that in a while but let's first start with a small question so let's say i want to know one hecto meter is equal to how many picometer okay so the first and the foremost thing you have to do is draw this table okay and the second thing is locate the two which you have to you know relate so i want to relate hecto which is somewhere here and pico which is here okay half my work is done now i will just calculate the difference between the two and i'm there with my answer so now from hecto to deca there's a difference of one zero okay from deca to basic again one from basic to deci again one then again one then again one now from milli to micro there's a difference of three zeros okay 10 to the minus three is going to 10 to the minus six so it's three then again this is three and then again this is three okay as and when i add all these numbers it's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen so total is 10 to power 14 okay so of course by looking at this uh, table i know that hecto is a bigger unit as compared to that of pico so one hecto is going to have a lot number of pico right one pico cannot have a lot number of hecto because that is going to be something which is not right mathematically right so since hecto is a bigger unit so one hectometer is going to have 10 to power 14 picometer and that is your answer okay so well you can practice different questions out and uh, you just have to just memorize this table you also you don't have to do that i'll give you a way to do that okay you just have to point out the two words which you have to make comparison between and just calculate the difference of zeros between the two and you're done okay so now let's come to the main part how to memorize this table so if you see this table which i've written on your screen how to memorize the value of zeros i think i've told you just a basic quantity may you write one then to the power one two three after three you follow three is table and below uh, you just do the same thing in uh, you know having a negative sign and now if you see the initials okay of the table this is t g m k h d basic quantity is not included okay then d c m m n p so there's a mnemonic which you can memorize two girls made kites having delicious dim sums can make me nice and pretty okay so i've written this mnemonic for you so that if you want you can just you know uh, take a screenshot of the screen and you can be happy with that so basically having delicious more dim sums will not make anybody nice and pretty but this is a way good way to memorize this table so i guess i have made myself very clear with what are unit conversions how do we go about solving the questions of unit conversions and how do we memorize this table uh, so if you have any doubts you can actually of course come back to me and you can read the notes which are provided and if you have any doubts just you know I think one question will be enough so now what we already know is that an atom okay of any element let's say of copper okay well any atom is so small so small that we cannot measure uh, you know the weight of the atom in the units that we already have we have units like gram milligram kilogram microgram whatever unit we try we cannot measure the mass of this atom because well it's too too small okay so scientists wanted to develop a new unit for measuring the mass of atoms and you know things which are as small as atoms so that unit was called atomic mass unit or your unified atomic mass both mean the same thing right so this atomic mass unit was a new unit which was only and only for measuring the mass of your atoms because well they are too small and uh, you always have to remember that whenever we are writing any you know number with a u or with the amu it is going to signify the mass of atom okay it is not going to talk about mass of a series of atoms or many atoms or which we see together okay so but also we at the same time also we have to do calculations and when we are working in lab we cannot work with one atom or two atoms or 20 atoms in lab we are working with actual you know salts and actual uh, elements so in that case we have to measure them in grams okay so now this was a problem when we talk about mass of single atoms we're talking in another unit which is amu and when we are doing experiments in labs at that time we are going to talk about it in grams because well 
we cannot you know we have to work with what we see and since we cannot see single atoms we have to work with a cluster of them right which is of course in grams so the main issue was you know a bridge a bridge had to be developed between grams and your amu and this bridge is nothing but your avogadro's number which is 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 is that clear even if it is not clear i will try to make it more clear now one atom of any uh, at element you think about okay one atom is equal to you know it has a certain weight and that weight is going to be in amu so let's say i'm talking about carbon atom i know it is 12 amu one single atom of carbon is going to weigh 12 amu if i'm talking about oxygen it is 16 amu if i'm talking about hydrogen it is 1 amu okay so basically one atom of all these elements is going to weigh respective amus all right but let's say i want to work in lab with carbon okay in that case i'm not talking about one not two but actually a lot amount of you know atoms of carbon together so if i take not one not two but 6.022 into 10 to, to the power 23 atoms of carbon okay that is going to weigh 12 grams and 12 grams is something which I can easily measure in my lab and it's quite visible to me. So now this bridge is now complete. Okay. Similarly, for oxygen, if I talk about one atom of oxygen, it is going to weigh 16 grams, 16 AMU. But since I'm not able to see a single atom, I want, you know, a measurable quantity. So if I take not one, not two, but 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 atoms of oxygen, that is going to weigh 16 grams is this clear again for hydrogen if i not if i don't take one two but actually 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 atoms of hydrogen that is going to weigh your one gram okay so now basically your I, uh, avogadro's number is nothing but a bridge between your uh, amu mass and your gram atomic mass and that is what it is okay so with this i will just write a small you know sentence sentence and we can use that sentence for any given question which we have on mole concept and that is going to work wonders the only basic thing which we need which should we should have a basic knowledge of is your unitary method and if you don't know that we'll discuss that in a while also so let's try doing that now one mole okay just write this line somewhere and i think it's going to work for every different atom you know molecule that you have in life okay one mole is equal to 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 entities okay i'm writing entities because this could be atom this could be molecule this could be iron this could be anything okay so instead of writing all these three i'm just writing entities is equal to atomic mass or molecular mass or ionic mass okay formula mass or i should say in grams all right and let's say that matter that we're discussing is actually a gas it may or may not be a gas okay if it is a gas or a liquid in that case it is equal to 22.4 liters so once you write this line for any element or any atom or any molecule anything that you have you can solve any question of atomic uh, of mole concept i'll do that in front of you and you'll know why okay so now let's talk about carbon i know carbon uh, has an atomic mass of 12 grams one single atom weighs 12 amu and 6.022 into 10 to power 23 atoms weigh 12 grams that i know okay there's a table of atomic masses and which you of course have remembered uh, in your 10 standard if you have not done that you should do that at least 20 uh, atoms starting at 20 atoms k masses you should know okay so now for carbon if i'm writing this line we have one mole is equal to 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 since carbon is what an atom right so atoms of carbon is equal to 12 grams because the atomic mass in grams of carbon is this much and since carbon is not a gas i think this is going to be enough okay so th if there's a question the question says how many okay 
atoms of carbon are present in 6 gram of carbon okay so now i want to know how many atoms are there in a given amount of uh, mass okay so what i'll do is since i want to you know establish a relationship between two things number of atoms and the grams so in this line which i already have written about carbon okay i'll just highlight these two so i want this and this okay means number of atoms and the grams what i have to find out is how many atoms so this part i have to find out okay and uh, this part i already know is given to me as six grams okay so what i'll do is whatever i want to find out should be on the right hand side so i want to find out the number of atoms so i'll just write i just replicate these two again but with the number of atoms on the right hand side and the grams on the left hand side because this is unitary method so 12 grams have 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 atoms okay of course 1 gram of carbon is going to have 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 divided by 12 okay and how many do i have in my question 6 grams so for 6 grams it is going to be 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 divided by 12 into 6 okay so the answer is going to be 3.011 into 10 to the power 23 atoms so i think it's quite clear what you have to do is just write this line one mole is equal to this many number of atoms or molecules or whatever is equal to its gram atomic mass and that is going to solve your question just establish a relationship write it again and you're done okay so let's do it with, for a molecule also all right and it, things are going to be more clearer to us so okay now my question is uh, let's talk about now um, methane okay methane is actually a molecule the mass is going to be what 12 plus 4 which is 16 grams okay now one mole of methane molecule since now methane is a molecule is equal to 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 molecules of methane okay since now i'm not writing atom i'm writing molecule since the methane is a molecule okay above this i was talking about uh, what carbon and carbon was an atom okay is equal to uh, we have to write the molecular mass in grams which is 16 grams clear okay since again ch4 is a gas so we can also write 22.4 liters at stp so this stp is very important what is stp stp is standard temperature and pressure and we'll talk about this in detail some other day but remember this that only at stp the volume is going to be this much for a gas okay only if matter is a gas in case of carbon it was not a gas so we, we, we did not write this line now my question is how many moles are present in 8 grams of methane okay so now of course as i said you write this line for the molecule which you want to talk about so it's methane so i've written this line about methane establish relationship between the two things which you have to establish so how many moles are present in 8 grams so the gram thing is here and mole thing is here okay so i want to establish a relationship between this one and this one which you want to find you have to put it on the right hand side so how many moles so moles is going to be in the right hand side so 16 grams is one mole i'll just copy this line as it is but whatever i have to find out is going to be on the right hand side okay for 16 gram it is one mole for one gram it is going to be one upon 16 mole and how many moles do i have i think how many moles are present in 8 grams so for 8 grams it is going to be one upon 16 into 8 okay which is 0 0.5 moles is that clear so you have to do nothing whenever you have a question of mole concept always remember that you just write this line okay for whatever atom whatever molecule that you may have 
and then you just establish relationship you just you know copy that two uh, things which you have to find out a relationship between and always remember whatever you have to find out you keep it on the right hand side whatever you already have you keep it on the left hand side and uh, that's just unitary method and mole concept is nothing but simple unitary method okay and mole is nothing but just a number and this number is just a bridging gap between amu and gram mass and that's all so i hope i was able to make things quite clear you can practice out as many questions as you can and you should do that very important topics of some basic concepts of chemistry okay so the first one out of these three is your emm or effective molecular mass okay the second one is percentage purity okay and the third one is your percentage yield so a lot of questions can be asked from these three topics and that's why discussing them is most important but the first and the foremost thing which i'll say before i start discussing these topic in detail is that we should have a prerequisite of whatever that is done in ncert ncert of some basic concepts should be on our tips and we should know what is stoichiometric calculations and how do we go about solving any stoichiometric equation that we have be it limiting reagent elemental analysis whatever okay and the most important thing is balancing okay i can't stress it enough that whenever we have questions related to any stoichiometric analysis okay be it all these three or we have anything okay what whatever we have studied in ncert we should always always work with a balanced chemical equation otherwise we should not okay so the first thing which you should we which you should see is whether your or not your equation is balanced only then you move over, move ahead okay so the first one is your emm which is your effective molecular mass okay i just write it effective molecular mass and the formula of effective molecular mass emm is total mass okay of the sample in grams divided by total moles of the sample so well emm is one such uh, you know calculation which we always do for a mixture of gaseous Uh, for a gaseous mixture sample okay so whenever we have a mixture of gases only then sometimes the examiner can ask about the emm of the you know gaseous mixture we also sometimes use it when we do the next chapter which is the gaseous state so that's why the calculation is very very important so we just have to memorize the formula and there's no rocket science here uh, so we'll just practice one numerical and we'll call it a day in a container we have 16 grams oxygen and 56 grams nitrogen calculate the emm so i think it's quite simple we have a formula of emm as total mass okay in grams divided by total moles so total mo mass we already have which is 16 plus 56 all we have to do is we have to calculate total number of moles and divide these two together so first we'll find out the moles of oxygen okay which is and always remember this is oxygen o2 okay so don't write the molecular mass as 16 it is actually 32 because it is oxygen gas so oxygen in gaseous state is in the form of diatomic in a diatomic form which is o2 right so it is molecular moles is equal to given mass which is 16 upon molecular mass which is 32 0.5 moles right and if we talk about the moles of nitrogen it is the given mass is 56 upon molecular mass is 28 which is 2 moles so the emm is quite simple we have total mass which is 16 plus 56 divided by total moles which is 0.5 plus 2 this comes out to be 28.8 so the emm of a mixture of 16 grams oxygen and 56 grams nitrogen is 28.8 okay so i don't think it's a very difficult calculation very simple formula and just the application part is important okay and we have to know we should know how to calculate the number of moles and we are done next question is this one and this is a try yourself okay so if you know what is if you have learned what is uh, emm and if you know what is equimolar ratio and equimass ratio i think it's very easily very easily calculate the emm of these two it's a good question you should try it and if you have any doubts of course you can ask next topic which we have to understand is percentage purity so when we talk about of course in chemistry 
uh, we talk about drugs, uh, pharmaceutical drug synthesis. Okay, in that case, uh, you know, whenever we talk about formation of drugs, the entire drug which is synthesized is not pure. Okay, there are certain pure and impure impurities in the solution in the drugs drug formation and not just in drugs but also in general chemistry when we talk about synthesis of any new reactants or products uh, some of some amount of the react uh, of the you know synthesized mixture can be pure and of course the other uh, half can be impure so percentage purity is very simple it is the pure sample amount of pure sample in grams divided by total sample right multiplied by 100 because since it is a percentage so it has to be multiplied by 100 okay so a very simple question we have here a 12 gram sample of a pharmaceutical drug contains 11.57 grams of active drug calculate the percentage purity so active drug drug is the only is of course the pure drug right because if it's pure only then it's active so percentage purity is very simple it's 11.57 this is the pure part divided by total part which is 12 into 100 okay so you can just do this calculation and you can get the answer to whatever uh, percentage you get and that is your percentage purity here okay so you can get this question in different different forms all you have to remember is that uh, pure part is going to be on the numerator and total part is going to be in the denominator multiplied by 100 you have the percentage purity now we have the last part uh, which is percentage yield Okay. so as I said in chemistry when we talk about synthesis reactions okay so let's say we have a reaction 2a changes to b okay where 2 uh, and here 1 they represent the stoichiometry of the reaction that 2 moles of a are going to convert to 1 mole of b right but when you actually go in the lab and perform the reaction you can see that if you take 2 moles of a they will not convert to exactly 1 mole of b but it should be it might be a little less than 1 mole, one mole okay it can be 0.98 mole it can be 0.99 mole it can be 0.9 mole 0.7 mole also sometimes reason being that whatever you do is not perfect okay there must be some errors which you perform some errors which happens due to whatever reasons which are there in the lab natural reasons and that's why the amount that you should get is a little less than the amount you expect of getting from the stoichiometric calculations which you know right so percentage period percentage yield is that only it is actual yield actual yield which you actually get in your lab divided by the expected yield expected yield is something which you expect which means you already calculate based on your stoichiometric calculations which you can do based on balanced chemical equations always remember we can expect it or theoretical yield theoretical means which we theoretically calculated in 200 so it's very simple right now we have a question which is um, this we have in a reaction 30 grams of CaCO3 converts to 15 grams of CaO calculate the percentage yield so first we have to write the balanced chemical equation this is CaO Ca, so the equation is CaCO3 converts to CaO plus CO2. Okay, so I'll just delete this. Okay, now this is a balanced chemical equation. This is already a balanced chemical equation, so I don't have to balance it enough. Now, I if I just put if I just calculate the mass here, it is 40 plus 12 plus 3 into 16. Okay. 16 which is 100 grams and this is CaO which is 40 plus 16 which is 56 grams okay so just applying unitary method we have 100 grams of CaCO3 converts to 56 grams of CaO okay 1 gram will convert to 56 divided by 100 and we have I guess 30 grams right 30 grams of CaCO3 so according to this calculation i think we get the answer to be yes 16.8 grams okay so now we expect 16.8 grams to be formed in a reaction if we are taking 30 grams of CaCO3 CaCO this is CaCO3 right i'm so sorry so if you are taking cs 15 grams of cs 30 grams of cso3 you expect 16.8 grams of cao to be formed but you actually get only 15 grams so now your actual yield is 15 divided by 16.8 into 100 
and you get I think 89.2 percentage as your answer okay so these were the three main topics which I wanted to discuss without ending this entire unit if you have any doubts you can ask and thank you so much for watching stay tuned for more